All right, so uh, the last problem was kind of long, um, but I don't think the tools of that problem were anything new to any of us. Uh, but this next one is kind of a fun problem, not too terribly long, but the question statement may look uh, tedious, but it's not. So the statement reads, as you know, the magnetic north pole on the Earth does not coincide with the geographic north pole. In fact, it's off by about 11 degrees. Relative to the fixed axis of rotation, therefore the magnetic dipole moment of the Earth is changing with time, and the Earth must be giving off magnetic dipole radiation. A. Find the formula for the total power radiated in terms of the following parameters. Psi, the angle between a geographic and magnetic north poles. M, the magnitude of the Earth's magnetic dipole moment. And omega, the angular velocity of the rotation of the Earth. B, using the fact that the Earth's magnetic field is about half a gauss at the equator, estimate the magnetic dipole moment, M, of the Earth. C, find the power radiated. And D, pulsars, pulsars are thought to be rotating neutron stars um, with a typical radius of about 10 kilometers, a rotational period of about 10 to the negative 3 seconds, and a surface magnetic field of 10 to the 8 Tesla. That is outrageously powerful. What sort of radiated power would you expect from such a star? Quite a bit is what I would expect. Okay. So, quick solution. Let's just dive on through. So, part A, we know from a couple, or a couple of previously done questions, like in 11.4, that the power radiated will be twice that of an oscillating magnetic dipole. So, we could multiply the power radiated formula by 2, or we can reference uh, question 11.11, .11, which we found that uh, power was equal to mu naught m double dot squared 6 pi over c cubed. Okay, well, in that particular setup, we had that uh, shifted uh, and rotating uh, dipole, and that's what we have here. So we let little m of t be big M, the Earth's uh, magnetic dipole, cosine phi, the angle between geographic and magnetic. Um, so we have that to the polar angle, and then we have to apply the sine uh, to the cosine omega t. Again, that's the axis it rotates on and sine omega t y hat. So this looks like a very typical spherical setup, right? Remember we had an azimuthal angle and a polar angle to the xy plane. So this looks pretty good, we like this. That being said, if we take the double time derivative, we see that that z component goes bye bye, has no time component. So all we're left with is a repeated of, a, re a repeated uh, cosine and sine, but with the negative and an omega squared on it. So, fair enough. If that's the case, then we square everything. We just get m squared omega to the fourth sine squared phi due to the fact that we get a cosine squared plus a sine squared, and that goes to 1. So, our power here, based on the results of 11.11, .11, is mu naught m squared omega to the fourth sine squared phi over 6 pi c cubed. All right, not too bad. If you can set up that magnetic dipole moment, you're good to go. All right, so part B, we know the magnetic field. Uh, we know the magnetic field in terms of its value at half a gauss. So we need the formula that replaces the dipole field with the dipole moment. Okay, reason why is because if we can write the dipole moment in terms of the field, then we already know what the field strength is. So now we can know what the dipole moment strength is. So we know that B dipole uh, with respect to the dipole moment is mu naught m over four pi r cubed. 2 cosine theta r hat plus sine theta theta hat. Here, r goes to big R, little m goes to big M, and theta goes to pi over 2, since we're at the equator. So the polar axis is at 90 degrees. Once we apply that, we get B dipole with all the substitutions, and we see that we're only left in a theta hat direction. So kind of useless information with respect to the numeric answer. Uh, but we can now solve for big M, so we multiply that 4 pi uh, r cubed over, divide by the mu naught, and now we have the uh, magnetic moment uh, with regards to the magnetic field. And so numerically, what we can do when we plug this in is, again, half a gauss gives us 5 times 10 to the negative 5. Again, not too much. You know, it's just not that big. Uh, so the dipole moment 
um, is 1.3 times 10 to the 23 AM squared. So again, area or amps per meter squared. We think that's big, but I, I assure you that magnetic field is not that strong. All laboratory magnets get stronger than that. Uh, and then C, P is equal to, well, let's apply everything we know. Now that we have this guesstimation or this estimation of the magnetic moment, we can plug it into the power formula. The only thing we have to be aware of is that that omega to the fourth, we need to break down. So we go through two pi um, radians in a day. So we have 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, and 60 seconds in a minute. So that's the breakdown there. And we see that we get four times 10 to the negative five watts radiated. Again, that shows you how little it is. Uh, so with that, um, you know, if we do the same thing and we apply this, you know, magnetic moment structure to the uh, pulsar and we try to simplify that down and cancel out, what we're left with is 8 pi omega squared r to the cubed, r cubed b all squared sine squared phi over 3 mu naught uh, c cubed. Again, we just kind of average that to one half there. Uh, but if we plug everything in that was given for the pulsar, what we see is that the power radiated is 2 times 10 to the 36. 36, that is outrageously stronger than what we see in part C. 5 times 10 to the 40 times larger, that's a very, very strong magnet. 